Hello, this is Marcos Patchett, the nocturnal herbalist, and in today's video I'm going to be talking about vaccination, and specifically vaccination against or for COVID-19. Now this is a video I've been procrastinating about, to be honest, for quite a while, just because I'm very aware that it's a controversial topic, and I think my take is going to please neither one nor the other. It's not going to please the people who are really pro-vaccination and it's not going to please the people who are really anti it either, I don't think. Um, the reason for that is I really want to just lay out the, at least my understanding of the science behind the vaccines, um, the, the new vaccination technology being employed, and I want to lay out some of the arguments for and against the use of that technology. Um, the reason for this is, the reason for me doing this is not really so that I can come to a conclusion one way or the other, because simply put, I don't think the bare facts support a conclusion one way or the other. I do have a personal bias, which I'll uh, disclose in a moment. I, I have my own, um, def it's a bias, it's not a conclusion, it's a personal bias, but in terms of the, the actual facts available, in terms of the, the, the evidence, uh, I don't think one, a conclusion one way or the other is, is merited, despite the um, evangelical level of certainty displayed in the mainstream media, effective and safe, or the uh, equally vociferous level of opposition by many people who are absolutely convinced that this is a depopulation scheme endorsed by Bill Gates and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't, I don't, the, the, the reason I want to do this video is because I think that kind of factionalization is inherently a problem. Not holding those viewpoints, but the way that the discourse is conducted. And I think the most useful thing is to understand and appreciate the rationale on both sides. And even if you already have your mind made up or have already received vaccination or already know that you're definitely pro or con, so that you can have a more open-hearted discussion with people who have the opposite opinion without getting completely airy and aerated and crazy and, and um, falling into the black hole of apocalyptic thinking that is taking people's minds over at the moment. Um, and the, the videos I did on social isolation last year, I did one video called Chocolate and Social Isolation, which I, I'd highly recommend to you. Um, but in that video, I, I talked also about the effects that maybe social distancing policies particularly have on um, enhancing social isolation for many people. And that has a very negative effect on social anxiety and on reads of social intent. So it will cause a proliferation of conspiracy theories thinking. Again, this says nothing about whether those conspiracy theories are right or wrong, but it does speak to a lot of the intensity with which we're having disagreements now. And it's it, to me, it's not about whether or not, about who's right or not, about whether our social structures are good or bad, about whether our leaders have malign or benign intent. I suspect, as usual in human history, it's a mixture, but it's about the only constructive way forward is for us to actually not go crazy and talk to each other in a rational and kind way, hopefully. The links to any papers that I'm referring to, any websites, any, all the receipts are below the video in the, um, you know, usual description box, whatever, on YouTube. And um, uh, I will put a list of timestamps below the video so you can go forward to any topic that is of interest to you, because this is going to be another long one. As I discussed in a, I did a video series last year, I'm gesticulating up here because I should put the link on the screen now, should be here, um, about social isolation. And in one of those videos, I discussed this phenomenon where whenever there's um, a an epidemic or, or a, a high prevalence of disease in a population, it tends to make politics more authoritarian. And the thing that worries me far more 
in fact, than the current pandemic. Because in history, pandemics come and go. And yes, they kill lots of people and lots of people die and that's horrible. But the thing that worries me more than that is the potential effect that that may have on the shape of world politics and policy. Because that is something that may be, be with us for decades to come after the pandemic has, has gone, assuming it does go. Which I assume it does, because if you look at history, even the even I mean, some some uh, pathogens linger and recur for centuries, like the Black Death, and others tend to uh, pop up and recede relatively quickly, like the the, the Great Flu pandemic in in nineteen nineteen, whatever, um, which was around for a couple of years and killed loads of people and then disappeared. So I mean, the flu is still around, but you know what I mean, like that the that severity, that intensity wasn't around for so long. The, the point about this uh, is that I think that the, the danger in this situation to me has always been um, the potential for authoritarianism to become more normalized and the sort of perennial human tendency to dogma and to seek answers or redress for difficult situations through um, po sort of political means, I think is inherently potentially problematic because you, you can end up creating systems of, or, or endorsing systems or permitting systems of authoritarian control, which ultimately cause far more harm than the situation they were called upon to address. Um, that, that is my concern. So I think it's really important for us to be mindful of the way in which we're conducting any sort of dialogue. Whatever you think about, for example, the mandation of vaccines for people. And I know that there are people who have very strong opinions on either side for that. There are some people who think vaccines should be mandatory and others, and I'm gonna pin my nail, my, my, my flag to the mast here or whatever um, and say I'm very much against that idea and that's irrespective of whether the vaccine works. I am absolutely against the mandation of any medical treatment for anyone unless you, um, unless for example that there, there are always caveats so in that situation I might endorse the um, sectioning, for example, if somebody is a danger to themselves and to others, then that may be an exception, um, a danger to themselves and to others. And, and I suppose that argument is the argument that would be co-opted, I would say, by those who would mandate for vaccination in a pandemic. But it's really, at this point, it's not that simple. And even if the, as I'll go on to explain, and even if the vaccine was shown demonstrated to be 100% cast iron effective, I think the, 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 the individual should have autonomy to decide unless the treatment was 100% risk free, which it is not. Um, so, you know, the, the, there's, there are, anyway, I don't want to get into the weeds, into the morality of it right now, but that's my opinion. Now, so just to state my full biases before I get into the, the, the vaccination of it all. Um, my own opinion on these matters is I'm, as I've said, a, sort of generally a, a, a medical libertarian. I think people should have complete autonomy over what happens to their bodies and with medical treatments. And obviously I am a herbalist. I'm a big old hippie, uh, non-mainstream person. I am generally in favor of and a proponent of normal vaccines um, in the sense that, you know, if you, you, you have to have uh, vaccines against, you know, the usual stuff like TB and polio and diphtheria and all that yet, yeah, because um, history has shown and the statistics show that they are effective. 
In terms of their safety, they seem to be safe. I don't know that there have been any really thorough, rigorous, long, longitudinal population studies exploring whether or not there may be a link between the emergence of autoimmune diseases or other long-term immunological problems in society, because uh, obviously autoimmune diseases, cancer and so on, have really proliferated over the last hundred or so years, and that may be linked to vaccination programs, but it also may be linked to 24-hour lighting. It may be linked to an increase in pollutants in the environment, and it may be linked to the standard argument, which is that people are living longer. Um, so these are multifactorial issues. The point though is that in medicine you operate from a risk-benefit ratio standpoint. In other words, what are the risks of this treatment and what are the benefits of this treatment? And if the benefits outweigh the risks, then it's generally considered to be something that's favourable. And obviously there are lots of factors that would alter that. Um, you know, such as uh, the vulnerability of a person to a particular problem, the relative severity of the problem if they don't have the treatment and so on and so forth. Um, but that risk benefit ratio has to be accessible. And with most of the vaccines that we already have, the ex extant vaccine technologies, that risk benefit ratio is pretty clearly in favor of the vaccine technologies. This is not to discount the fears or misgivings of anti-vax people, because as I say, I think for a lot of vaccines, the long-term potential links between some vaccines and other problems haven't been, despite what proponents of vaccines say, really, um, what's the word, discredited, but they they aren't exceptionally likely and it looks like um, most vaccines are safe. So certainly in terms of uh, very deadly diseases, um, vaccines are, are generally advisable. So for example, if I'm traveling, I'll, I'll take the rabies vaccine, I'll take the yellow fever vaccine, whatever, whether the standard vaccines for travel. In this pandemic situation, a similar logic or argument is being used for the new, the novel vaccine technologies being employed here. So we have an argument being made, um, and hopefully I'm not going to straw man this too badly, that the vaccines are necessary in the pandemic because even though they may be, may be, a slightly higher risk than normal, even though that is something that is not talked about in, in the mainstream. And I'll say why I think that is in the moment. I think it's probably obvious to most of us, but um, even if they were slightly higher risk, let's say, the argument may go that um, the benefit on a world population level of cutting this pandemic off, the spread of COVID off at the knees, which an effective vaccination program would be hoped and expected to do, would outweigh the risks to people, assuming those risks were relatively small. And let's say that those risks are four or five times higher than a normal vaccine, which obviously a tiny proportion of people who receive normal vaccinations have demonstrable um, clearly linked side effects from that vaccine. A very small proportion of people have, even if it's 10 times that many, on a global scale, because COVID is so infectious, mutates so rapidly and um, kills, say, let's say 1% of people who get it, that would be worth it in terms of numbers. If you're just being cold, hard numbers, it would be worth it. Um, I personally don't think that justifies the propagandistic line, effective and safe, and the, the standard narrative that the reduction of the standard 10 plus year development timeline for a vaccine to about a year has made no difference to the potential safety and efficacy of this vaccine in this case. I don't buy that. I see no evidence there is. As, as many people know, we are in fact in a stage three trial right now. This is a large mass clinical trial for the, for the human population. I think it would have been 
I think it would be far more ethical to tell people about that, but I understand the motivations of governments and authorities for not telling people that. It's the same motivation that impels wartime propaganda, you know, like where you say, you know, your country needs you and all that. The, 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 I'm, and I'm really steel manning the pro-vaccination arguments here or buttressing them, uh, in, in my view, in, in the sense that, that there's an argument for saying to people it's definitely effective and definitely safe, even though the evidence does not fully support that. The evidence, as I'll discuss in a moment, does suggest that the vaccines are probably safe, but we can't be entirely sure because the phase three clinical trials, in other words, the large scale longitudinal over a long period of time trials in human populations haven't been done are being done now in live action, in, in real time, in the pandemic. So we won't know. We won't know how safe and how effective they are. So it is a gamble, but I think the gamble was made consciously. This is assuming no malign intent on the part of the authorities, which I know that many people who are, like many of my friends who are really against the vaccine, assume that the vaccines are part of some global control initiative thing. I don't know. But I'm assuming that your average human being who is not um, sort of, you know, a, a, doesn't have narcissistic, tyrannical ambitions or whatever, uh, doesn't have malign intent, isn't nihilistic or doesn't want to wipe out most of the human race for out of some sort of... Um, you know, fever dream of, of reducing the population to benefit the environment or something or whatever the argument is. Assuming that's not what's going on, the, the propaganda in support of the vaccination programs is designed to encourage maximal uptake because the assumption is that using these vaccines at this time is the best chance we have of curtailing the pandemic. And that, I think, is a very reasonable proposition, but there are counter arguments. So let me get into all the, the sciencey stuff. Let me start with a little bit of background on the coronavirus itself. And then I'm gonna talk about a bit of the basic immunology of the immune system. So anyway, coronavirus, a little bit of background. So SARS-CoV-2, uh, SARS coronavirus 2 or COVID-19 is slightly different from previous sort of SARS. So there was SARS 1 in 2002 to 2004, which uh, caused, which had 10% mortality. So a higher death rate than SARS CoV 2, which popped up in 2019, of course. But the difference is SARS CoV 2, as many of you will know, is highly contagious. Um, it, 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 one person with COVID-19 will infect 2.2 other people on average. Um, and the spread, as we know, is asymptomatic. So people can spread it when they're not even presenting as ill. Uh, and there's a low mortality rate because it spreads more widely. It has a, uh, it's more dangerous um, overall. Uh, and of course, in between those two, there was MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which is another coronavirus, MERS-CoV in Saudi Arabia in 2012, which had even higher mortality, 35% mortality, but I believe had the lowest um, reproductive number. It had the lowest rate of spread. So those previous coronavirus mini epidemics didn't get to pandemic scale because A, they were nipped in the bud on time, and B, most importantly, they didn't spread as readily or as quickly. Um, all coronaviruses are what are called enveloped viruses. That is, they have a little protein coat. Um, this becomes relevant when you're talking about treatments, uh, and I will be discussing that in my next video, which I haven't filmed yet, that's going to be an update on the use of herbal medicines in COVID, because there's some new papers, some new information out that's really exciting, and there's some new trials being done, which is great. So I'm gonna do a little update on that, and the structure of co coronaviruses will be relevant to that. So anyway, uh, that's that's next, that's later. Um, all right, so a few different groups of viruses, lots of different families of viruses, but just to differentiate between RNA and DNA viruses. DNA, genetic information, famously double helix structure. I'll put a little picture on the screen or whatever. Um, that's like two strands of what are called nucleotides, which are little bits of like protein, little building blocks of protein. And 
information basically and RNA is a single strand now RNA is kind of like a potato print of one strand of DNA so in every cell in our bodies there's the genes, the chromosomes, which are wound up um, coils of the DNA. And then when those, um, in the, when the genetic information in the center of the cells is being used to print proteins to make whatever, organs, uh, parts of the immune system, neurotransmitters, messenger molecules, whatever, whatever, when they're being called upon to, to um, uh, you know, give their information up, the uh, DNA, uh, the, the DNA sort of unwinds a little bit and an RNA uh, is a sort of potato print of that DNA. It's like a mirror image or carbon copy of, of the DNA. Now, some viruses are made, are, are basically just little coils of, of DNA with um, some sort of housing unit. Um, and some viruses are just RNA with a little housing unit. Viruses are really interesting because they're basically nature's little robots. I, and I call them that sort of advisedly because that's not to say that they're designed, although there are some really interesting wacky theories about how viruses even came to be that are um, sort of extraterrestrial origin and stuff that are a real trip. I mean, whatever you think of that, they're, they're kind of interesting. But assuming an evolutionary origin, they are just um, really uh, packages of genetic information self rep no not self replicating they're 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 packages of genetic information that rely on other organisms to replicate them and in the process cause changes in the genetic structures of those organisms so they are almost like nature's little nanotech robots that drive evolution and they do that i think in two ways one because infectious viruses tend to kill off weaker members of a species or whatever. Uh, they might thin the herd, as it were. And two, they actually, because viruses, when they get into cells, insert their own DNA or RNA or whatever and cause changes in the genetic makeup of cells. They accelerate mutation and, and that has a role in evolution as well. So they're kind of, uh, as I say, like nature's little evolution robots. And they don't meet all the criteria of being alive. Uh, biologists or biology teachers out there will know the five criteria of, of, of being alive. I can't remember them all. I know one is reproduction, another is motion. Um, I can't remember the others. Which is respiration. Uh, in other words, they produce their own energy. And I think out of all of the, uh, I can't remember the other two, but you, I'll put the list on the screen. But out of all of them, I think viruses don't meet a lot of those criteria. They don't move on their own, um, they don't reproduce on their own, and they don't respire. So they really are like little robots. And what they're just ba little parcels of genetic information with some kind of little membrane around them and then like a little injector, you know? So the injector is, is just like a, a protein structure that enables them to stick to cells and have their genetic material injected into the cell. And then the cell's ordinary apparatus for printing proteins grabs hold of the viral information and starts printing it. So viruses are kind of like little boxes from Ikea with a manual inside. And the manual is a set of instructions for making more manuals and more boxes. So when they get delivered to a cell, the cell takes them in and just ends up making more and more of these manuals and boxes. And if the virus is, 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 is pathogenic, it will take over the whole cell. So the cell just ends up printing viruses and stops doing what it normally does. And that obviously causes illness and problems because and the immune system eventually realizes what's going on and destroys the cell or tries to get rid of the virus, which I'll get onto in a moment. So that is my really uh, basic um, crude cereal box summary of viruses. So, okay, so DNA, which I talked about, which is the double helix genetic information, a double helix strand of nucleotides arranged in matched pairs. Uh, it's kind of like Morse code information for, for making proteins. Um, and RNA is a single strand of nucleotides made with the sugar ribose instead of deoxyribose, which is DNA. That's the DNA is deoxy, deoxyribonucleic acid and RNA is ribonucleic acid. Okay, so when you get this genetic information from a virus entering a cell, the cell prints off the proteins using the RNA template. So if the virus is an RNA virus, 
the viral RNA goes straight to the bits of the cell, which is called the Golgi or the ribosomes, beg pardon, which print off that um, those proteins straight off. Um, if it's DNA, a viral DNA, then the cell will manufacture its own mRNA, messenger RNA, becomes relevant for the vaccines, to mirror the viral DNA and then start printing that off, basically. And then those go uh, to another part of the cell called the Golgi apparatus, where they're packaged up in little vesicles and little bubbles and then um, exported uh, out of the cell as new viruses. So that's what viruses do. But in the process, as I say, of injecting their genetic material into the cell, and that genetic material being copied, some of their genetic material often gets incorporated into or changes the structure of the cell's own genetic code. So they actually drive evolution in that way. And the second way, as I say, is that the viral infections by taking over cells in this way and eventually causing those cells to malfunction if they make that organism sick enough so that it dies they will whittle out they, they will uh, get rid of weaker members of the species so harsh but that's uh, biology for you um, all right so covid19 is a single stranded enveloped rna virus so it's, uh, its RNA is ready to print. As soon as it enters the cell, it can start printing new viral proteins using the cell's own apparatus. Biology of viruses, they're super small. They're metabolically inert. As I've mentioned, they have no respiration. They can't produce energy of their own, little robots. Um, they exist only intracellularly. So while they can float around in, in outside cells and stay on surfaces and whatever, the main bit of their existence is inside cells. Um, they use host cells to synthesize their parts. Um, they have that their, their little capsules that surround their RNA or DNA have either a helical or icosahedral structure. Put those on the screen so you can see what I mean. Um, and some viruses have a lipid and protein envelope, a surrounding, uh, which I've mentioned, and COVID is of that type. So part of the coronavirus, COVID-19 genome, encodes for four proteins. The genome is just the name for the all the genetic material of that organism. So your COVID-19 mRNA, all of it together, encodes for four types of proteins and they would be the spike protein which we know a lot about and heard a lot about now which is uh, a protein on the outside of the virus that looks like a little spike sticking up that enables the virus to bind to um, and get and inject its RNA into cells of the host organism of humans in this case. The envelope proteins the proteins that make up the bubble surrounding the virus, its skin, the membrane proteins, which are the proteins that sort of like help to, um, uh, like that sort of inner skin, if you like, of the of the um, of the of the virus, and the nuclear capsid protein, uh, which uh, that's the, that's the sort of little central bit that contains the uh, RNA, um, and. And the, the nuclear capsid proteins also are important in the viral budding. That's the viruses being ejected, the finished product, the new IKEA boxes with the new manuals in, the new little virus robots getting ejected from the cell. Without the nuclear capsid proteins being intact, the viruses won't be intact or functional when they, they leave the cell. Um, the rest of the genome Apparently, codes for proteins involved in replication and RNA synthesis um, or other proteins for evading the human immune response. Generally speaking, there's non-specific and specific immunity. So non-specific immunity is the part of the immune system that um, attacks generally foreign stuff. <laughs> so uh, it sounds like it's very xenophobic, but generally it attacks and kind of invaders on a non-specific level. So that includes particular cell types like macrophages, they're called macro big 
Farge meaning eater, they're, they're cells that go around just like mobile dustbins, swallowing up anything that shouldn't be there. You've got your natural killer cells, which spot any cells that look like they're behaving abnormally and get rid of them. Um, you've got other white blood cells, so-called cells in the in, of the immune system, such as neutrophils, that go around uh, zapping anything that looks strange. Essentially, the non-specific immune system is always doing its job, just patrolling and getting rid of anything that looks like it shouldn't be there. You've also got antibodies being produced by the non-specific immune system. Now, um, antibodies, it always sounds to me a little bit like um, the female equivalent of dad bod, like you've got an antibody, but that's not, not what it means. Antibodies are little proteins produced by the immune system, which kind of function like circulating flagpoles or antennas. They stick to um, strange looking cells or foreign objects and um, send out a little signal to the immune system to say, look at this, look at this, and the immune system will come along and eat them or dispose of them in some manner. Uh, they can do other stuff too. Antibodies can sometimes cause, like they stick to these cells or foreign objects like flagpoles, and they can cause them sometimes to clump together so that they're easy, so they can kind of uh, like glue lots of different things together and it'll raft so that they're easier for the immune system to come along and dispose of. So anyway, so that's antibodies. Now antibodies are, there are antibodies produced by the non-specific immune system, which are pretty weak, they're not super strong, but one of their functions is to just um, help the immune system dispose of things which shouldn't be there. Now, if you have a particular pathogen, a particular virus or bacteria that's causing a problem that's got out of hand, then the specific immune system will eventually kick in and deal with it. Now, that's there's a bit of a delay with that because what has to happen, first of all, is that the body has to realize that it's being attacked. Then it has to send out signals to the specific immune system. Then the specific immune system has to rally its troops and, in fact, has to kind of manufacture its troops to respond to this um, threat. So um, the way that happens is you have, say, in the case of a virus that gets into cells and reproduces itself, co-opts the mechanism of the cell to reproduce and then replicates, um, is that all the time every cell in your body is manufacturing proteins. It's making stuff, it's making hormones, it's making um, other proteins for, it's just making, every cell in our bodies is making stuff all the time. That's the short answer. Um, so what they're doing when they're doing that is every cell being like a little factory is producing little samples of what it's making on its surface. It's like showing um, it's, it's, it's exporting little samples of what it's doing, like a little show and tell on its surface. Why? Because the patrolling immune system is constantly checking each cell in the body, checking what it's making. And if a weird protein shows up on the surface of that cell, something that shouldn't be there, the immune system's gonna go, uh, uh this shouldn't be here. And it'll either directly destroy the cell or it will signal to, uh, other cells to, to start doing stuff. So uh, the proteins on the surface of the cell that, um, this is gonna get complicated if I'm not careful, that the, the, on the surface of the cell that there are things called antigen presenting complexes or APCs. And these are the things which show exam samples of what's being made in the cell, of the proteins being made in the cell. Uh, and they're, they're of two types, MHC1 and MHC2. MHC1 uh, APCs, or these MHC1 uh, complexes uh, on the surface of cells that show what's being made in the cell, those are found on every normal cell in the body. And when they show up something that's wonky, that the cell is making something that it shouldn't be, then they are reacted to by cells in the specific immune system called CD8 cells, uh, which are the sort of shock troops of the uh, spe specific immune system. And the CD8 cell will latch onto that cell and just destroy it. Done. On cells of the immune of the of the immune system, like macrophages or neutrophils, the cells that go around patrolling and just eating stuff that sh looks like it shouldn't be there they will show what they've eaten on their surfaces. 
they will extrude those proteins onto their surfaces just like your normal cells who are manufacturing things will do. Um, but their um, APCs, their antigen presenting complexes are called MHC2. Um, and MHC2 cells are responded to by cells of the specific immune system called CD4 cells. Now CD4 cells are the coordinators of the whole Im specific immune response. And if they latch onto something on one of these immune cells and they think, uh-oh, that shouldn't be there, that they've eaten something that's clearly a danger, then those CD4 cells will signal other cells in the immune system to do something about it. And one thing they'll do is they'll signal white blood cells called B cells, which produce and manufacture antibodies to particular pathogens or organisms to start to expand or replicate, uh, uh, clone themselves. So normally in your body, you only have, you've got billions of them, but you, I think billions, but loads. Anyway, loads of B cells, but they're dormant most of the time. Um, but when they get activated uh, in this way, so an immune cell eats something that shouldn't be there, it extrudes one of, a little sample of it, this is what I ate earlier on its surface, and a, a um, CD4 cell comes along, recognises it, and then will signal to B cells uh, to produce antibodies to that thing. So the particular B cell in your system that produces antibodies that are the closest match to that thing that shouldn't be there will get selected and will expand. So it's kind of like the immune system has this fast acting evolutionary process built in, which is pretty incredible. So what vaccines are designed to do for the most part is to enhance antibody production. So they, they trip your immune system into uh, manufacturing, into this process of selecting uh, a B cell for clonal expansion and manufacturing antibodies to whatever the invader is. And they do this uh, classically by just injecting a dead virus or um, a bit of a protein from a virus, which will then get eaten by a white blood cell, displayed on its surface, CD4 cell comes along, goes, uh-oh, that shouldn't be there, and then um, trips the B cells to expansion and to produce antibodies to that virus. And those antibodies, as I mentioned before, function as kind of little circulating flagpoles or, alt or, or antennas that stick to these invaders and notify the immune system that they're there and they need to do something about it. That is a classic um, vaccination thing. So for COVID, the targets for um, the vaccine development, I talked earlier a little bit about the structure of the virus, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus of COVID-19. Um, so any of the proteins that make up the body of that virus could potentially be targets. In other words, and your immune system could produce antibodies, little flagpoles that stick to any of those proteins. So what are the candidates in terms of the, the virus? So we've got the one that has been used, which is the S protein, the spike protein. Um, this is the protein that the virus uses to bind to receptors on the surface of human cells, particularly the ACE2 receptors, so-called. Um, and those ACE2 receptors, by the way, are found in the nose um, and the lining of the sort of airways, uh, in the heart, in the kidneys and in the intestines. So COVID gets into your system via cells in those places, um, in linings, and mostly the linings of the, of the gut and the lung. Um, so the S protein is considered a good target because it's on the surface of the virus. So it's easily spotted and stuck to by antibodies in the immune system um, and by cells in the immune system. There's the N protein, the nuclear capsid protein. Now you could produce antibodies to that, but that's less of a good target because it's inside the virus. So it's harder for antibodies to stick to. So that's considered to be not such a good protein. There's the M protein or the membrane protein. That's a possible target. And there's the E or envelope proteins. These are considered to be difficult because of their structure and they're relatively low quantity. There's, there's fewer of them. So uh, 
according to the authors of this paper that I'm quoting, that will of course be in the comments, the link to the paper, all the papers that I'm talking, using in this video will be linked in the comments box. Uh, that, that paper is from Chung, Phone and Quan in 2021. Um, and they say that the E protein is unlikely to induce an immune response. So essentially you're left with the S protein and the M protein, the spike protein and the membrane protein. And it's, the spike protein is the easiest and most evident sort of sticky outy bit on the virus that is, it's, it's, um, so it facilitates vaccine development more than any, anything else. In terms of COVID vaccine development, the S protein is the one that's been selected uh, for reasons I've just talked about. Antibodies to the S protein can be recovered from the bloodstream of, can be um, extracted from the bloodstream of recovered COVID patients. In other words, people who've recovered from COVID, um, are, their immune system is naturally producing antibodies to the spike protein as this external protein on the surface of the virus. So it seemed sensible to develop a vaccine uh, that would amplify that response. The, one of the issues here is that, the, and I will note this here and come back to this later, the spike protein is very prone to mutation as a protein on the surface of the virus that is, um, enables the virus to get into cells. If it changes shape, then the immune system may not recognize it. So it requires new antibodies in that case. Typically, vaccines can be administered nasally, orally, intramuscularly or intravenously. So intravenously directly into the bloodstream, into the muscle, so there's sort of slow, gentle release. Uh, nasally for some, it really depends on the type of the virus, whether it's live, whether it's dead, what its structure is and so on and so forth. So the authors of this paper, this uh, Chung, Thon and Quan paper in 2021, suggest that for effective COVID-19 vaccination, uh, memory T cells in the lungs should be primed against SARS-CoV-2. And that, interestingly, is not achieved by intramuscular injection. So I don't know where that leaves us. Um, but th there are various forms of vaccines under development, and these presumably are still being developed. There's inactivated whole virus, which is more like a classic type vaccine, uh, where you just get the whole virus that's dead. Now, the issues there are that the immune system seems to respond to that extremely aggressively, such that it may make people just as sick as if they got real live COVID. Um, that is a type of vaccine that has been worked on by, perhaps deeply ironically, the Wuhan Institute, uh, the uh, company name for that is Sinovac. Um, the next type of virus that's still being worked on is a live attenuated virus. So that's a live COVID virus that's weak, made weak. Same problems as the previous one, um, that it, it tends to produce too aggressive an immune response. So you could get the whole cytokine storm drowning thing. Um, and also there's the added danger of it could just mutate and revert to its aggressive wild type. In other words, it might start off weak and then get stronger as it replicates. So not, not that promising. The third type is one of the types that's being deployed, and this is an RNA virus. So um, RNA, in this case, they've taken the RNA that um, signals manufacture of the spike protein, and they've found a very clever method of delivering that into the system by enclosing it in lipid nanoparticles, little tiny globules of fat that protect it so that it can get into the system. This then diffuses into the cell. So a normal virus has to sort of latch on and inject itself because these pieces of RNA are so tiny, they can literally bloop, just get through into the cell and then your cell will start to um, print off 
the RNA and manufacture the spike protein. How is this different from being infected with a live virus? Well, the RNA is not going to replicate inside the cell. It's not going to take over the whole cell. It's literally just going to diffuse into the cell and your cells will produce a small number of spike proteins. The potential issues with that are not that it's going to somehow intercalate or insert itself into the DNA. It's not that it's going to take over the cell in the same way that a wild virus would but there are some issues with this, which I'll come back to later, and those issues are to do with the spike proteins. Uh, this is the type of vaccine that's been developed by Moderna and by Pfizer. The issues with its development, the technical issues with its the RNA is highly unstable, um, so they've had to sort of, it has to be transported at very low sub-zero temperatures, and then it's got this amazing sort of lipid nanotechnology that enables it to be delivered, which is pretty cool. But there are the, some safety issues with it that I will discuss later on. And in fact, as many of you will know, what is being done now on a global scale is a phase three clinical trial. In a normal vaccine development, the reason it can take so many years is because even when a vaccine passes its safety trials in animals and then in early, st early stages in humans, you have to do a longitudinal trial in a larger population. In other words, you have to give a, a, a large number of volunteers uh, this in, in injection and see how they go over a number of years because not all side effects happen straight away. And say a number of people in that group within sort of four or five years developed serious illnesses that people in the other groups didn't, you would then know about it. That is called a phase three clinical trial and that is what we're undergoing currently. And uh, I'm not sure everyone knows about it. Hopefully anyone watching this video, you, you do now know about it. So you can choose whether to be part of that trial or not. Now this is of course, um, the vaccine, the, these mRNA vaccines have passed their initial safety screenings in animals and in humans, um, but we are in a phase three clinical trial. So um, the next type of virus is a DNA virus. Um, so similar idea to the RNA virus, only this time they're, they're rather, the RNA is sort of ready to print. Uh, it's, it's the form that like gets into the cell and the cell immediately prints it off. The DNA virus is not ready to print. So for this one, um, the cell has to produce some mRNA to it and then print it off. Um, the issues with this type of, of vaccine are that it, has, it produces generally a lower immune response, has um, a much more complex specific delivery tool that's required for it, and often repeat doses of it tend to cause toxicity and I'm, or, or you know, side effects, severe side effects. So I'm not sure that there are any of those in circulation at the moment. Um, the next type of vaccine that's in development is recombinant S protein um, vaccine, which is where they're kind of taking the S protein and uh, trying to build a little sort of um, trellis <laughs> or delivery system around it. Um, sort of like an artificial dead virus that doesn't replicate. Um, the problem with this in so far is that it's tended to produce a lower immune response, requires many more repeat doses and requires adjuvants, which are substances administered with vaccines to whip up an immune response. And many of these adjuvants are very controversial, like this is aluminium and things in vaccines that, you know, anti-vax people get really worried about and, and perhaps with good reason in some cases because even though the doses are very small they are known toxins that's why they induce immune response again risk benefit ratio if the vaccine protects you against a potentially immediately deadly threat and protects the population against mass death then that tiny increase in risk from the addition of an adjuvant is considered to be or adjuvant, not sure how you say it, but uh, is, is considered to be worthwhile. Uh, but essentially this one is, is this recombinant S protein type vaccine is not one that's yet made it to market. And the final type, yeah, is the viral vector based vaccine. Now this is what I call the Frankenstein vaccine. I don't mean it in to say that it's a scary monster. It's just, they've kind of like made a new little mutant virus. 
Hello, this is editing Marcos. I just, uh, I'm having to film this little insert because I realised that while editing the video, I'd kind of messed up the explanation for the um, viral vector based vaccines. And these vaccines have been manufactured by AstraZeneca, by Johnson & Johnson and by Janssen Pharmaceuticals. What they are basically is they've, they've taken a fairly weak virus that isn't so problematic called a type of virus called an adenovirus and they've genetically modified it they've put into it the dna from covid 19 that codes for the covid spike protein so the virus is a live virus that's included in the vaccines and when when it's injected it'll infect some of your own cells and it'll insert as viruses do, it'll insert its own DNA into the cell's DNA and then your own cells start printing off the viral DNA. It'll manufacture mRNA and then the mRNA will get printed off into proteins. Um, now, this won't start generating live COVID vac uh, vi viruses because the only bit of DNA they've taken from COVID-19 is the DNA that codes for the spike protein. But what it will do is it'll make sure that any cells that are infected by this vaccine seen uh modified adenovirus will that it'll start th those cells will start printing off spike proteins manufacturing spike proteins it'll stick examples or samples of those on the surface of the cell the immune system will pick them up and then the immune system will start producing antibodies to the spike proteins this is very clearly explained in a little article that i've included a link to in the description box on youtube from the new york times it was the clearest and simplest explanation i found for it so it's very accessible so have a look at that. Um, so that's how that vaccine potentially works. Okay, so we've discussed the vaccines. I broadly mentioned some of the problems in development, some of the hurdles that had to be got over and some of the issues with each of those different types of vaccine and the ones that have got to market and briefly mentioned a couple of potential issues with those major obstacles and complications here and these are mostly hypothetical but these are things that can occur the first one is antibody dependent enhancement sometimes when you get the immune system to manufacture these antibodies these little flagpoles that stick onto things and tell tell them that the immune stick onto invaders and tell them that tell the immune system that they're there what can happen is that the antibodies that get produced are not that good. <laughs> They're a bit shonky. So this might be the case if, for example, you have produced a vaccine using the spike protein on an existing type of COVID as your model. By the time it gets to market, let's say, just for the sake of argument, that the virus has mutated a bit and the shape of the spike protein has changed a bit. If that happens, then your vaccine is going to be encouraging the body to produce antibodies that aren't quite the right shape and haven't got the best fit. If that happens, these suboptimal antibodies can actually end up assisting the virus getting into the cell. So, it, and this is a known reaction, it's called antibody dependent enhancement. And in fact, that is what happened in animal trials of the modified vaccinia Ankara vaccine. And this is, uh, which is uh, based on pox virus, um, utilizing SARS-CoV-2 protein. So this is sort of analogous to the AstraZeneca uh, jab where they've modified an adenovirus. Uh, in ferrets, they gave the ferrets this uh, modified virus and it ended up causing the production of these suboptimal antibodies that actually increased the infectivity, reduced the host's immune response because your body's busy producing these rubbish antibodies instead of the ones that are actually needed uh, and uh, caused more of the ferrets to die due to lung injuries. So that is one potential issue. Now they found that the, the mRNA vaccines in the preliminary trials prevented um, infection more than 90%. So it, it is effective. It is an effective vaccine, at least in 90%. One in 10 people 
didn't work or didn't work very well at all. But nine out of 10 people it worked. And that was why it was given all emergency use authorization in the UK uh, in December 2020 and, and in the US about the same time and I think pretty much worldwide. And that was the uh, Moderna and, and Pfizer. I think the Pfizer one was the first one to get that. And the other type of vaccine that's currently mainly in circulation is the viral vector-based vaccine and that's produced by AstraZeneca, uh, Johnson & Johnson and Janssen Pharmaceuticals. They're all slightly different. The issue here is, as the authors say, the possibility of presenting different immune responses, meaning some people will get a very strong immune response to this as if they had COVID. Others, most hopefully, will not get that. But the issue is because you're using a live virus, even though it's not a problematic virus to deliver the spike protein uh, to the immune system, um, it could produce in some people a very powerful immune response. So the other major hypothetical issue with the viral vector-based vaccines, the type made by AstraZeneca, John Johnson & Johnson & Janssen, which are, are the ones which are the sort of adenovirus containing the DNA from COVID-19 that codes for the spike proteins, is that because the viral DNA for the spike protein actually gets incorporated into the host genome. In other words, it gets incorporated into your own infected cells DNA. In theory, there may be no time limit for those cells printing off those spike proteins. So whereas with the mRNA vaccines produced by Moderna and Pfizer, where the mRNA is just injected into you, uh, passively diffuses into cells, and then those cells print off spike proteins for a while until the mRNA gets broken down, with the um, viral vector-based vaccines, because it's a live modified virus, the cells actually get that COVID-19 DNA for the spike proteins in it like into your genetic material and then those cells will print off spike proteins potentially for as long as they live now i don't know i don't know if when those cells die um they that if they will replicate before they die because because their virus uh, their genetic material has been tampered with it may be that the immune system will eliminate those cells uh, natural killer cells or cd8 cells will come along and eliminate the cells that would be the expected outcome however if for some reason the immune system doesn't eliminate those cells and they replicate in theory, hypothetically, you could have a reservoir of cells in your body that keep producing low levels of spike proteins for a while, uh, for an indefinite amount of time, because because the 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 uh, COVID nineteen DNA that codes for spike proteins has actually been inserted into your own DNA in those cells. As I say, in theory, the immune system, once it's triggered by the spike proteins being displayed on the surface of the cell, should actually not only just produce antibodies to the spike protein, but should also come along and destroy the whole cell. So this is a bit of an outside possibility, but the the major issue with both of the main groups of vaccines on the market now, the mRNA vaccines produced by Moderna and Pfizer and the um, viral vector-based vaccines which utilize the DNA coding for the spike protein, as in the AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson and Janssen vaccines, is that all of them cause your own cells to produce spike proteins. And we now know that spike proteins themselves are somewhat inflammatory um, and can potentially cause clots and things like that. So in theory, if you had somebody who was maybe 20 years down the line heading towards perhaps developing diabetes or some sort of organ failure in old age like pan or, or some inflammatory problem like kidney kidney inflammation or kidney failure or pancreatitis or something whatever whatever and and they were heading towards that either for genetic reasons or for lifestyle reasons or for a mixture of both in 20 or 30 years time if again this is all extremely hypothetical but if you had um, something introduced to their system which increased the background level of inflammation substantially then for a healthy person that that may not produce any immediate problems but for somebody who perhaps is heading towards an inflammatory problem that background production of spike proteins 
uh, might actually tip them over into inflammatory problems. And it really depends how much background production of spike proteins you get and how long it goes on for. So with the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, we know that they're mRNA based. So in theory, the mRNA should get broken down. Um, it should degrade after, after a, I don't know, a few weeks, months. I don't know what time, but it should degrade. However, there's a theory that if, if somebody was co-infected by another type of virus called a retrovirus, which there are a few in nature, retroviruses can actually reverse engineer mRNA into the cell's own DNA. So in which case, you know, there's, but this is very theoretical, but I'll include links to a couple of papers which suggest that might be a, a at least hypothetical possibility in the links um, in, in, the, in the comments box on YouTube. Um, but the major issue I would think is is less so with the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines because that mRNA being reverse um, reverse engineered into DNAs is less likely. That's certainly not built into the vaccines themselves. But again, this is all very hypothetical. These are things which, while perhaps unlikely, are certainly worthy of discussion and consideration. The argument by the vaccine manufacturers has been that because this vaccine is introduced intramuscularly uh, into the sort of deltoid in the arm, it's not going to be carried around the whole system uh, in the circulation. So it's a moot point. It's yeah, the, the, the spike proteins are only going to be present in the muscle fibers. Um, so your immune system will just will just notice they're there and produce antibodies to them and they're not going to accumulate anywhere. However, there's been it's been discovered that they they do circulate in some people they do get into the circulation um, and and one reason for that may be because um, there are blood vessels in the deltoid in the arm and I think I saw a video by Dr John Campbell on his channel where he made a very an excellent point actually that because when people are trained to administer these vaccines particularly the Pfizer vaccine they are not they're, they're injecting and they're told not to aspirate not to draw back any fluid not to suck out any fluid before they inject they're just told to inject and he correctly points out that if you aspirate when you stick the needle in you can immediately see if you've hit a blood vessel because blood will come into the syringe and he says if people were trained to do that when administering these vaccines if they hit a blood vessel if they aspirated first before they injected and saw any blood in the syringe they would just take it out and put it in somewhere else and he said that may obviate this issue. It may prevent these uh, mRNA particles being administered into the circulatory system so they get distributed around the whole body. Um, I think that's an excellent point. Uh, and one, again, which just seems to have been ignored. Uh, the other issues, the other potential issues, these have really been flagged up by uh, Geert van den Bosch, who is an immunologist who worked for... I think I think the Gates Foundation, but he developed lots of vaccines for many years and he has become very controversial just sort of putting his views out there on why this vaccine program is a bad idea, etc. Now, I don't know whether he's right or wrong. I'm, I'm not an immunologist, but it sounds to me like his ideas have weight. And I've put a link uh, in the description box on YouTube to a really good interview with him by um, Brett Weinstein, who's an evolutionary biologist on on his YouTube channel, uh, Dark Horse Podcast. Um, which is, is definitely worth a watch. And he goes through all the immunology in detail. But this is my um, summary of, of Geert's arguments from that video, from that discussion, which is the clearest um, dis discussion of his views. Uh, so Brett does a good job of translating them um, in, in, in that because Geert's like hyper intelligent and very, very immunological and technical in the way that he, he, he talks. Um, so Geert's argument is that there are many infectious variants of COVID that are in the world simultaneously. In other words, all these different mutant varieties are, are constantly around there. And that because the people who have received these vaccines still shed virus. In other words, the vaccines don't, as, as is normal with normal vaccines, they don't stop you getting, the virus doesn't, the virus still gets into your system. It, they just, in theory, make your immune system a bit more efficient at eliminating the virus the specific immune system a bit more efficient remember it's sort of like those specific antibodies which take a few days to be produced and manufactured by the immune system because the b cells that respond to it have to so the vaccines by one means or another they encourage your your specific immune system uh, the b cells the relevant b cells to replicate and to produce antibodies that help your body identify covid 
okay so far so good but um people who have been vaccinated will still have a little population of virus in their system and will still shed some virus uh, most vaccines don't prevent infection just increase the immune response efficiency and they reduce but don't entirely prevent spread so they'll uh, somebody who's effectively vaccinated for whom the vaccination has worked properly will have an effective efficient immune response to the virus and will suppress its numbers and they'll they'll have a reduced amount of uh, like viral particles in their cough in their breath or, or saliva or whatever but that they'll still be be shedding some so the vaccines will prevent sickness but but they will still allow some some spread um which is normal um so so Geert's argument partly one of his arguments is that um the antibodies the, the, the spike protein may change, which I've already discussed. So if the virus evolves, the spike proteins change, it makes the old variants of the vaccines redundant. So we'd have to keep producing new vaccines. Uh, and that, you know, loads of people will, will, will tell you that's not such a huge problem. But it just means we have to keep constantly revaccinating people. And as long as the vaccines do prove to be safe and do prove to be effective, that wouldn't be such a problem. But Geert points out that um, your he he really points up the distinction between the innate immunity or the non-specific immunity and its non-specific weaker antibodies, uh, or what he calls natural antibodies, and then the specific immunity in these specific antibodies produced by the B cells, um, and what he suggests is that it looks like the innate or non-specific immunity is really important in COVID because um, people who get COVID less severely typically have a stronger innate or immediate natural immune response to the COVID. Um, if you have to wait for your specific immunity to kick in, and this is more typically the case for people who are older, whose immune systems, whose innate immunity is a bit weaker, whose, but whose specific immune system is more experienced, let's say, then their innate immunity may not be quite as quick off the mark and the virus replicates a bit and then the specific immunity gets hold of it and really starts kicking in. They usually have a harder time of it because the specific immunity sort of kicks up more inflammation. That's a really hyper simplified view, but, but, but that is, is one of the things that, that, that happens. And his argument is that ideally you would want to vaccinate them with less variants, with less wild type variants around in the general population so that after vaccination, people had time to develop antibodies to that specific strain of virus and then it would squash it. But because there's so much virus in the general population, it's mutating at a very rapid pace. And what you're effectively doing, he argues, is doing the equivalent of what's called a serial passage experiment in the laboratory where you put evolutionary pressure on a virus to evolve more quickly. You apply immune pressure to it to um, it's, it's enough immune response to attack the virus but not enough to disable it completely. So and because people who are vaccinated keep shedding virus and because the virus is replicating really quickly and we know that people who have had the mRNA vaccine can still get a bit sick, you're, you're effectively doing that. So what he's saying in a pandemic when so many people have the virus and there are many different variants out there is you're effectively putting pressure on the virus to evolve more quickly and to solve a puzzle, to solve an immunological puzzle, to get more infectious, to get more challenging and his his argument is that the more people we vaccinate in the heat of this pandemic particularly with vaccines which would take a while to squash a particular variant of covid and are not going to be effective against all types of covid you're actively enhancing the what's called the virulence or the pathogenicity the potential danger of the virus and he argues that over time what we'll see is it's starting to infect children it becoming more uh, more dangerous rather than less dangerous which is obviously totally hypothetical but it's a valid 
hypothesis. So Geert says basically there are two issues of pandemic. One is the rapid evolution of different wild types of COVID, which could reduce vaccine effectiveness. And two is there's insufficient time to prime the immunity against um, the types that are already out there and that could actually reduce people's immunity to different variants effectively. Um, so yeah there, there are some um, details there which I think are um, technical. I'd urge you to go and watch the, the whole video if you want more detail but he talks about this problem of immune escape which is what I've just described where we're putting evolutionary pressure on the virus to accelerate its, its development um, and essentially forcing it to breed more infectious variants. Um, so uh, what else does he talk about? He talked about, as I mentioned, the natural antibodies of the non-specific immune system may not neutralize mutant viruses but may still bind to S proteins and that um, they may outcompete non-specific natural antibodies. And okay, so what his this is the final argument. I think this is one of his more um, uh, abstruse, tricky arguments, but it's really interesting. What he suggests is that, uh, and this is a variant of an argument that I've already mentioned. Geert suggests that because um, these vaccines will encourage the production of antibodies to specific varieties of S protein that once you've been vaccinated they will encourage the production of this antibody at the expense of other antibodies that your immune system under natural circumstances might rely on more and what this will do in his view is squash the innate or non-specific immune response. Those weaker non-specific antibodies produced by the innate or non-specific immunity that seem to be really critical for preventing COVID from becoming more serious. This innate non-specific immunity, as I mentioned several times, is stronger in the young, which is why so far the young have been less affected. But his argument is that as we continue to vaccinate, we're essentially accelerating the mutation of the virus. And bear in mind, it may mutate this way anyway if it just spreads uncontrolled through the population. So the worst case scenario is we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't. But in, if, if the virus mutates, then um, there's a possibility that it'll start affecting the young anyway because it may become more, more virulent. But his argument is we're kind of forcing it down, down to become more virulent. And actually that the vaccinated people possibly may have a worse immune response. So this is a little bit similar to the, um, the issue in the ferrets in the experiment that I talked about um, that's called this antibody dependent enhancement, but it's different. He's not, it's not quite the same thing. In the ferret experiment, the antibody dependent enhancement, which was observed in the development of some of these vaccines, is where the antibodies that the immune system produces ended up sort of facilitating the entry of the virus into cells. This is something analogous, something similar, but not the same, where the antibodies you're, you're being forced to produce by the vaccine actually reduce the production of these weaker antibodies produced by your Im innate immune system, which seem to be really important for slowing down the progression of COVID and enabling the immune system to mop it up before it becomes more serious, if that makes sense. That's my cereal box explanation for a complex phenomenon that's probably inaccurate on several levels but I think does a reasonable job of sketching out the arguments. This is the, the, the final point I want to make which really speaks to how Geert's argument may hold water and I hope he's wrong. I really hope he's wrong because most of the people I know and love have had these vaccines so I want them to be effectively protected. Um, I, so obviously, so the, the neutralizing antibody response in asymptomatic individuals decreased faster and remained lower than in symptomatic individuals. I'll translate that in a moment, but that's taken from this paper I've been quoting a lot by Chung Thone and Quan or Quan in 2021, which is a paper about COVID vaccine development. What that means is that People who got less severe COVID were less severely affected, had a lower specific immune response to the virus. Uh, or, or rather, their, um, their, they, they, they had a less intense 
antibody response, basically. Their, their antibody response, their neutralizing antibody response, decreased, they were asymptomatic. Asymptomatic means they didn't develop any symptoms. So they had the infection, they would be positive on PCR or lateral flow tests, but they didn't have any symptoms. Their antibodies decreased faster and remained lower than in individuals who developed symptoms. What does that suggest? That suggests that gear is correct in asserting that the non-specific innate immunity, the early non-specific immune response to COVID may be more important. And this may be one reason, as I've said about five times now, why younger people have a less severe variant. So in actually approaching this with a vaccine or vaccines designed to increase specific immunity, the entire approach may turn out to be wrong-headed. And we will only know when all the statistics are collated. Now it does look initially as if the, some of the vaccine programs have been effective at reducing the numbers, at least in terms of numbers of people infected in care homes and things like that. But I think it's very, very early to make that judgment call, particularly as the virus is mutating all the time. And particularly as I think many of these statistics are not available and there is an enormous variance, it seems to me, between statistics that are publicly reported or, or reported like adverse events recorded by the public that you can find, for example, on the American, the USA, VIAS, Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System database versus those produced by officials like governments and such, where, where the, the government statistics seem to suggest vaccines are really effective. Uh, and the VIAS, which is obviously about vaccine adverse events, uh, seems to suggest there are some problems. By the way, the, the link to the VIAS, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting Service uh, from the US is, is below, so you can check out any statistics there. That Those public reporting systems have, have their own issues. Anybody can lodge a report about a vaccine adverse event, so there's no, there's no real control there. People could be associating anything. They might just get a, a, a little blister and say, oh, I had the vaccine this week, this was an adverse event. Um, on the other hand, people tend to, because it's a, a database that a lot of people don't know about and many people wouldn't even bother to report it, um, generally these things tend to be underreported. So we've got two conflicting things there that may be affecting the numbers reported in the database. On the one hand, people may over attribute symptoms to the vaccine or to different vaccines. And on the other hand, people tend to under report. So that's that's one issue. But there does seem to be a dispute between or, or disputes or discrepancies in the data from various sources, let's say huge discrepancies in some areas. And I confess I haven't done a lot of research here, mainly because statistics bend my mind and are a pretty guaranteed way to send me into a semi-comatose state where I sort of lose hope for humanity and, and my own sanity. So I, I tend not to go, go too far into them. Um, but there, there does seem to be some discrepancy there. So. I don't think that necessarily supports any anything other than the fact that this is a global pandemic and there are going to be different agencies collecting data in different ways. So we're only going to be able to collate and make sense of that over a long period of time. I also suspect that the official line, as I talked about at the beginning of this video, is going to be to promote this idea that the vaccines are effective and safe. The officials have backed this horse financially and ideologically. And I, I suspect there's, there are strong, very strong economic incentives behind these vaccine programs, billion, multi-billion dollar whatever finances going into them, which are driving those programs for good or for ill. And I also suspect that there are genuine uh, desires to help people and that people think this is the best way of doing it. Anyway, that is my take on the vaccines. Those are some of the issues. So, so just to sum up briefly, if I can, and I hope I won't forget anything, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put these arguments on the screen. The pro for vaccination is that it is purported to offer the best, um, as in most well-documented and researched 
method of in uh, of, of shutting down COVID. Um, that in the early phase one and phase two clinical trials, these vaccines which are available have shown good efficacy in the case of the Pfizer mRNA vaccine, that's about 90% effectiveness. Um, and they've, they've shown reasonable safety in those trials. And of course, the third big argument against it is this is an emergency situation if COVID is allowed to continue to um, spread unchecked, then um, the whole situation could get a lot worse. So, uh, and people want to return to normal quickly. So uh, the idea here is that we could stop the pandemic. Arguments against, I, I would say, are that um, the, uh, the vaccine technologies are incompletely tested. So uh, as in this is a phase three clinical trials, I keep saying, so we don't know what their long term side effects may be, um, if any, that um, some of these technologies are, are known to produce these unusually strong immune responses in some people, uh, severe um, reactions uh, occasionally in trials. And so that's 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 all safety. That's all safety concerns. We don't know what the long term safety concerns are, the, the, the safety implications. The second um, concern about the vaccines is is Geert van den Bosch's arguments uh, about how the vaccines could potentially um, drive evolution of of the wild type virus, basically make it more virulent. Um, that's essentially because we are uh, deploying uh, in, in insufficiently effective vaccines in a, uh, in, in a, in a pandemic situation. Um, and that could actually accelerate uh, the virulence, uh, the evolutionary development of, of the wild virus into more pathogenic forms. Um, and also uh, his, 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 he's proposing another variant of the safety argument in that they could potentially ac aggravate the immune response to the wild virus, possibly. Anyway, so uh, those are the, I would say, major, arg major con they're not arguments against their concerns. Um, so. I don't know. I mean, I, I think for for myself, I, I say I'm I'm fence sitting so hard on this one. I'm getting splinters. I really am. And I, I know that I could either way. You could be take. You could be making a bad decision because, for example, if it turns out the va the vaccines are as effective and safe as the manufacturers want them to be, and and as the early trials showed them to be, then by simply um, saying injecting doubt into people's minds potentially uh you know or, or encouraging people to maybe hesitate that 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 that's problematic but on the other hand if these things aren't discussed and it does turn out that down the line these vaccines cause morbidity uh that if by not saying something you could could be could be causing a problem the issue of course would be is wild covid more dangerous than the side effects from the vaccines and the answer is probably yes. So taking the vaccine is the more logical case. Assuming, assuming that there are no viable alternatives to vaccination. And this is where we hit a sticking point because there may be. So um, the information is out there. If you want to look, look for it, folks, there are potential alternatives. Um, I'm not going to suggest that herbs are an alternative to vaccination, but I am going to be doing an update on a video I did last year about the use of herbal medicine in COVID. There's some really exciting new research going on, which um, I'm uh, is a little bit more uh, heartening, uplifting, <laughs> uh, and that I'll be doing in my next video. I'll be re reporting that in, in my next video probably in another few months by the time I've edited this. So um, anyway, for anyone who's stuck with this all the way through to the end, thank you. I hope you found it useful and informative. Please do like the video. Please subscribe. If you're not subscribed already, please do stick any useful comments down below. And um, please share this video with anyone who may find it useful. Um, and thank you very much for watching. And uh, hopefully I'll see you in the next video. Thanks. Bye.